Thank you. I would like to thank Code Motion for inviting me over, and I would like to thank you guys for being here despite the very good weather. So thank you for not going outdoor. Um, this talk will be in English, uh, although I'm Italian, but I've been living abroad for far too long, and a lot of the things that uh, I'm going to be talking about, I just cannot explain well in Italian. So it sounds quite odd, um, and you will find that um, it will be all right in English, hopefully. So. Today, I would like to tell you a bit more about Android malware analysis and uh, how can we leverage on dynamic analysis to try to understand whether we could um, build machine learning models that enables um, analysts to classify Android malware in threat of families. Okay? So this is a joint work with a bunch of people, so students uh, that are at Royal Holloway University of London, postdocs at our faculties, and uh, visiting students. Um, the acknowledgement are all at the bottom. So before starting, I would like to introduce myself just a slightly bit. And I kind of like this, this icon there that uh, depicts the old school. Uh, uh, not really because it discloses a bit how old I am, but also because it allows me to thank uh, publicly a couple of people, a couple of research groups. So I got interested in information security uh, cybersecurity, call it whatever, it's more fancy nowadays. Um, I got interested in, in that topic around 1995. And uh, it was a very different landscape. Um, uh, I enrolled at the University of Milan as an undergraduate student. Um, we started having Telnet to connect systems at home. So a very, very different landscape, okay? Um, and then I started getting, getting interested in, in hacking hackers. Uh, I was not really sure what was all this about. So I started uh, Googling, but there was no Google at that time. So I started altavisting, if you just pass me the term, um, and tried to understand you know, what hacker was about, what, what it was hacking. So the truth is that at that time, you ended up mostly on questionable websites. Okay? So not really what I was really looking for. Um, but then I bumped into one article that was published on FRAC. Um, it's, it's a famous underground hacker um, electronic zine um, called IP spoofing demystified. Um, so I downloaded it, I read it completely, and didn't understand anything. Good. So the problem was not the English. It was a big problem with the English, but I didn't really understand the content there. But there was a book referenced, uh, TCP IP Illustrated Volume 1, that basically allowed me to understand a bit more about this fascinating word. So I sort of understood that mm, this is actually quite interesting, but it is much better not just to do random Google search or Altavista search, but also try to understand a bit more about uh, a topic. And at that time, I was starting to feel a bit lonely because I started to feel that I was alone, so the only one interested in these disciplines. Uh, but luckily enough, this is not true. And I met a bunch of people uh, that turned out to be friends, and um, I learned a lot from them. So this is the, my, my public kudos to them. So SoftPJ and Antifork Research, two big groups in, of the Italian scene, if you want to call it that way, of the late 90s. Then, because I decided that, well, passion is important, but also some solid understanding of how system works is also important. So I enrolled in the usual pay degree, like uh, the university. Um, so I did my computer science degree at University of Milan. Um, well, I'm cheating here a bit with the undergrad and MSc, so there was no the split MSc and BSc. It was a five-year degree, either you get it or not. So um, it took me a while to get there. Um, some interruption in between, so social services, going to work. And, but anyway, so I matured, and basically I started understanding that hmm, I quite like doing this. I quite like understanding how, this, how things work, and maybe I can also do this for a living. So I just enrolled in a PhD in computer science, with a specialization in computer security, and then halfway through my PhD, I had a chance to, to go abroad for what it was meant to be just a visiting period, and I never came back ever since. So um, I spent a couple of years at Stony Brook University, a couple of years um, during my postdoc after PhD at UC Santa Barbara in California, and a couple of years in Frey, um, Frey University in Amsterdam. Um, and I've always been working around system security, like in the broadest terminology that you can imagine about. Also about um, 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 activities perpetrated by malicious software, so analysis of malicious software. I started in 2008, I'm looking at the problem. So I'm now an associate professor of information security at Royal Holloway University of London. 
um, as one of the University of London universities, um, as a federation of university. This is the most beautiful building that we have, as the founder's building. Of course, my office is not here, nor, nor the office of my lab is here. We are computer scientists, so we get basements or crappy things like that. So the truth is that there are no basements because it's a very nice campus, but the building is not as nice as this one, okay? These guys over here, they're not magicians, uh, but they are part of the choir. So apparently we have a very famous choir that goes all over the world. So, but this is a badass picture, the only badass picture that I could find, so this is why I'm showing here. Um, a bit of story found in, at the end of 1800s by Thomas Holloway, entrepreneur, philanthropist, uh, uh, known for pills and ointment. You know, more like, so I don't know how really to say that in English, but it's more like, you know, when you go on the podium and say, you know, vengino signori signori, okay? So that was kind of the, the feeling back then. Uh, they found out that actually this pills and ointment contained in paracetamol, so it was actually curing uh, people to some extent. Um, Royal Holloway is one of the 13th academic, uh, academic Center of Excellence in Cybersecurity Research in the UK, and we host one of the two doctoral of, uh, Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity. Um, the other one has been awarded to Oxford. So in terms of security, we're quite happy to, be, uh, to join top universities. Um, I opened up in 2014 the System Security Research Lab, which focuses on system security. The underlying theme is using program analysis to extract properties of programs, binary or from the source code, and apply machine learning to tackle system security issues. There are a few projects that are going on at the moment. I'm gonna be talking to you about Android security for a little bit more uh, today, okay? So, why Android? Well, because it's, it's clear that mobile platforms are pervasive and are ubiquitous nowadays. I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard this many times. Right? You know, we use it for pretty much everything. Um, we, check, we check in online, we send text messages, pictures, we browse the internet, we share sensitive information, we store sensitive information and financial information. So it's a very interesting landscape. There is an app for that, although this is an Apple motto, but you can bring it here in the Android like, ecosystem as well. So there is a lot of um, um, wealth around uh, this ecosystem. And when, the, when there is wealth nowadays, there's also cyber criminals that are trying to make a living by uh, infecting users. So probably one of the most notorious uh, uh, malicious software that is spread nowadays on mobile devices is ransomware. So it is also on desktop environment, but ransomware. Because it's very easy. Like you get infected with a phishing application and then the ransomware just locks out your phone and it asks for a ransom. So it asks for money back to get your data back. Um, in terms of um, uh, threat on this ecosystem, so numbers are lower than the, the traditional desktop environment, um, but still we can see that vendors are very much busy dealing with a lot, a lot of um, uh, samples nowadays. So this is a report that uh, McAfee released last year and they have more than 9 million malware, Android malware, we're talking about Android malware here in their databases. Um, the total count of malware detected over six months is 37 million, and numbers are increasing. So this is just a snapshot of a vendor. I'm not taking the part of the vendor, but if you look at other vendors, they have slightly different numbers, but the order of magnitude and the trend is actually the same. So doing manual analysis is important, okay? Because sometimes you just need to manually reverse engineer a piece of malicious software, okay? Because it's either a targeted attack, it's something you've never seen before, and there are limitations of automated techniques. But with these numbers, we definitely need automated techniques that can deal with the problem, okay? So this is just, so the slides are quite dense, but I prefer to uh, write down a few extra information because I'm gonna be releasing the slide afterwards so you guys have time to go over it um, a little bit more at your pace and see also research papers that have been uh, linked here. So here, what I want to show you is a bit of most of the predominant research that has been happening in the Android ecosystem. Um, these venues are all good or top venues, so they're good papers, and good piece of research spanning from 2014 onwards till 2017. So Droid Civ is a work that we presented uh, yesterday actually in Phoenix. So sorry, I'm a bit jet lagged because I've just landed from Phoenix um, uh, here. Um, so, but basically most of the work that has been happening nowadays uh, relies on static analysis. So you take an application, you try to analyze it to extract statically some features. So statically means that you don't execute the application, okay? And it can be something as simple as grep, 
like wrapping for some, so looking for specific patterns, like permissions that are in the manifest, some APIs that you are invoking, so forth and so on. Or it can be something that is a bit more sophisticated, like you know, detecting the flows of information as, it, as the application um, um, uh, performance computation at runtimes, but you do this statically, okay? So this is a very sophisticated technique, information flow analysis, but it's also very expensive, okay? But here, just to show you that People have proposed all sorts of different um, approaches and the features, so the characteristics that they use to represent the behavior of any of these programs varies from syntactic features to information flow features, so all the way in the spectrum. And if you look at the results in terms of detection rates and false positives, they're actually pretty good, right? So you have 99, depending on the approach, 99, 93, 90, and so forth and so on, with, with something, you know, very, very small false positive rate. Now, the problem is that, okay, I don't have time to explain you that um, what, this real, what these numbers really means in the sense that most of these analyses look at uh, what is known as cross-validation. So you have a, a data set, you partition a data set in folds, and then you train on k minus one fold, and you test on the k fold, and you repeat this process k time, okay? This is just to hinder overfitting. So it's just to try to hinder the fact that the classifier learns way too well a specific training data set, okay? But however, by doing this, you're also learning from the feature because when you do partition a data set, you, train, you might train on the latest uh, case um, minus one fold, and then you test on the first one. So in a way, you're using knowledge of the future to detect the past. So it's not cheating, it's one way to do this. But another way to do this is actually understanding how your model performs over time. And in that case, this is a problem because in our domain, in, malware, in malicious software analysis, um, we have to deal with constant drift. So the behavior of malware changes over time, the models decays, and therefore you keep, they have to keep on retraining. But anyway, so good numbers as a baseline. However, there is pretty much none done on dynamic analysis. So it is sometimes necessary um, to actually look at dynamically extracted features because of the fact that it's so easy to obfuscate a malicious Android, sorry, it's so easy to obfuscate an Android application. So you can use, well, the classic form of obfuscation is you can encrypt strings, for instance, okay? You can change the contour for graph of the application, but also you can introduce reflection, which is pretty hard to deal at static time. You can uh, hide your code in native code. So from Java, you can execute native code, and that opens up a can of all the issues that we have in analyzing binaries. You can actually dynamically load some code. So DEX classes, DEX files can be loaded dynamically, and so forth and so on. So here we wanted to try to understand, okay, how far can we go if we just rely on dynamically extracted features? So I'm not advocating that we should be doing just dynamic analysis, okay? So both are important, but I'm just trying to understand how far can we go if we just had to rely on dynamically extracted features, okay? And, and here there are two questions that we would like to answer. So one, can we reconstruct the behavior of Android applications just by looking at dynamically extracted features? And if so, how? What is the level of abstraction in, in the reconstruction that we can adopt? And the second question is, mm, okay, this is pretty cool if it works. So it definitely helps an analyst in understanding what is the behavior of the application. But at the same time, we would like to have something that enables machine learning algorithm to take a decision. Because otherwise, it's important, but it's tough half of the story. Okay, the first question we'll try to answer with CopperDroid. This is a dynamic analysis system that we've been developing at Royal Holloway within my lab for the past two years. And there's been a bit of work in dynamic analysis. So in systems that execute Android applications to collect some form of behavioral um, uh, profile, okay? And if you look, the most predominant one is probably DroidScope or DCAF. So now it's built, built on top of DCAF. You guys have here a bunch of references and most of these things are open source. So the problem is that those approaches build abstractions, um, so build behaviors by looking at different abstraction separately. So Android applications are written in Java, in the Java programming language. You can invoke native code, which means that some semantic in it is in Java, and some other things is in binary. So when you open a file, you create a socket for network communication, you create a process, so forth and so on, it is clear that those behaviors will be uh, manifested as system calls at the end of the day. So the Android, um, the Android operating system is a modified Linux kernel, okay? So everything runs on top of a Linux kernel. <laughs> what it is not clear is, how about SMS? 
How about accessing the contact list? How about accessing the GPS? So all those sort of behaviors that are not really something that we're used to if we need to analyze traditional applications. In traditional applications, you write an application for Unix or Linux, Windows also, where you have system calls to create processes, uh, write to a file, create files, uh, create shared memories, and so forth and so on. But there's no notion of SMS, GPS, location, contact list, and so forth and so on. So most of these approaches uh, look at two different levels of how you can perform the analysis, and they need to keep these analysis in sync. Now, the, the other problem that you have is that the runtime of the system might change. So as you, I'm sure, are aware, before we had the Daldic VM as a virtual machine that runs Android applications. Now, although it's still possible to use it, we have the Android runtime system, so, which is an optimized compiled version where that happens as you install the application. This is a completely different um, runtime system, and if you do if you try to reconstruct the behavior of the application by looking at the Daldic VM, which is a Java-like virtual machine, we're well, no longer able to do that because there's, it's not there anymore. So you have the ART runtime system. So we wanted to understand, okay, can we do a little bit better? So can, can we look at one specific event, just very simple, from which we can observe everything that is juicy, that is sort of interesting for us? Um, so we started looking back at system calls. Okay, so system calls have been now the standard de facto way, one of the way to characterize the behavior of a process. Okay, this was started in, I believe, 1996 as a good way to represent the behavior of a process. So, because up until you interact with the environment or the operating system, well, people tend to believe that what you're doing is not too important. I'm not saying that it's not important, but it's not too important because if you need to create, if you need to um, leave a mark, uh, if I want to say that, well, you need, at the end of the day, you need to, to use a system call, okay? So you can encrypt a buffer, for instance, and for that, you don't need a system call, but what you do with this encrypted buffer, at the end of the day, it requires you to interact with the operating system to do something. So we sort of tried, I mean, we sort of asked ourselves, you know, okay, okay, can we actually use system calls because, well, this is a, Luni uh, this is a Linux kernel, so it's a modified one, but it's a Linux kernel, so maybe we can do system call. So if you do system call, you definitely see what I've just mentioned before. You create the processes, you create a file, you create a socket, uh, and so forth and so on. But what it is, it's not clear is understanding how much of these Android-specific behaviors are you able to observe from that. Now, to make a long story short, the key insight is that actually everything <laughs> is delivered through a system call. So the Android... Android applications are sandboxed, so they run as user space processes in their own other space, and they need permissions to perform actions. Okay? Some permissions are enforced by using the usual discretionary access control of Linux, so file system access is the same way of Linux. Uh, network access is sort of uh, a mix and match because it requires you to belong to a specific group, so, but it's the kernel that enforces this. But all the other things, permissions, are enforced in a sort of a mandatory access control system. But this requires, therefore, a way for an application to communicate with another application all the time to perform some actions. Like to send a, a text message, you need to contact the ISMS service. Um, so, and to do that, it means that, well, you cannot do it directly without going through the kernel because there is policy enforcement there. So what happens is that you need to rely on inter-process communication, right? The old-fashioned inter-process communication. But because this is used in this context, this is used quite frequently, um, Google, well, the Android operating system developers, uh, decided to get rid of the usual um, POSIX or System 5 IPC, and they used Binder, which is an open protocol, which is a very efficient um, uh, protocol that enables and realizes inter-process communication, which in Android is actually dubbed inter-component communication, because you can partition an application in different components, and you can use this form of uh, um, uh, Inter-component inter, inter communication to even invoke component of your same application. So, okay, this is pretty cool. So it means that maybe if we look at this inter-component communication, then we are able to understand all these interesting Android-specific behaviors that we're talking about. Um, sure, and so it turned out that actually all the binder communications go through one system call. It's more like you know the Lord of the Ring, one system call to rule them all. To rule them all. Um, this system called is IOCTL, so inter control, and it is usually used to communicate, to perform actions on devices. 
Well, it turns out that binder is implemented in the kernel and it supports a user space device, slash dev slash binder. So by opening the device, you can perform IOCTL um, query on the device and you actually perform uh, binder transactions. Okay, so let's see an example. So code here. Um, so here, this is a very simplistic application that sent a text message, okay? So I'm showing you this because there are a few ingredients that are all interesting. So one is that we create an object that's called pending, in pending intent, uh, uh, and we'll see later on what this object is actually is. So here we get a handle to the SMS manager, and then we invoke the send text message on top of the handle that we just got here, okay? So this is from a high-level perspective, it's super easy. So you can think that this is actually something similar, not exactly, but something similar to a remote procedure call, because the call actually happens on the remote side, okay? And this is this information, so the first argument is the destination number, uh, second argument is the source numbers, not in this case, hi there is the message, sent intent is, um, uh, tells the kernel or tells the system to notify the application whenever uh, the message is actually sent out, okay? So uh, in that case, when the message is sent out, the system notifies the application by sending uh, this object, which is a pending intent, and the pending intent contains an object intent that is actually sent out to the application as a notification, okay? And this is for delivery, but it's not in this case. Okay, so if we start unrolling, Okay, what happens under the hood? Well, we'll see here that there is actually a way to query the system to understand whether the ISMS service is running. Okay, so you have to think about this guy as more like you know demons on Unix. This is pretty much the same thing. Um, so here, this already generates a binder transaction. So this already tells the kernel, okay, tell me if something happens, and this can only be possible through a binder transaction. Okay, so if the reason ISMS service is running, okay, then we invoke send text on top of that and we'll pass all the arguments there. If we keep on unrolling, what happens now we are on the service side. The send text basically, whatever it does, it creates a parcel, it creates a parcel. So in Android, everything that is sent over um, intercompany communication as a binary transaction needs to be parceled. Parceled for Java is marshaled, okay? Why you need to marshal? Because you're sending complex objects. So an object that is complex makes sense in your address space, but you're sending the object representation to another address space. So from your application to the IASMS uh, context. So in this case, you need, to, um, you need to parcel, and well, this is just in a way to pass the parameters that are needed for the call, and then here you actually send out the transaction, okay? So this is the one that generates underneath uh, the IOCTL call. So if you have a system that tracks all the system calls, you're able to reconstruct behaviors that are properly like Unix-like behaviors, creating file, creating a process, um, network communication, so forth and so on, but you can also intercept all the binary communications that are happening on the system, okay? Which means that you can, in principle, recreate this semantic, okay? Now, this is where the IOC happens, and this is what you will observe on the wire, okay? So this is what you observe. It's pretty interesting, but not exactly what we wanted to reconstruct. So we want to have something like this. So we want to know that, oh, this IOCTL actually works on that binder. It's a write-read binder call. And what you're talking to, uh, who you're talking to is com Android internal telephony ISMS. The method you're invoking on that uh, daemon is syntax, and these are all the arguments here. As you can see here, there's a bunch of, um, there are, either primitive types, so string is a primitive type, this is a null string, but, um, but also complex objects, so intent is a complex object, okay? And the idea here is that we would like to reconstruct these semantic automatically all the time, okay? So we don't want to just write the code to deal with all of this. Why we don't want to write the code to deal with all of this? Well, because from a scientific perspective, it's not too uh, exciting, but also it's error prone. And as you move from one Android version to another, there is a shitload of new um, Android objects that are using binary transactions that are used. So we don't really want to do that, okay? So we don't have the stamina to actually um, uh, deal with the problem. But having a program that does it for us is actually an interesting way to do it. Um, so to this end, we created this, this CopyDroid. So CopyDroid is built on top of Kimu. Kimu is uh, a CPU, uh, it's an open source CPU emulator. Um, 
uh, that runs, uh, and, and sorry, and the Android emulator is based on QEMU, okay? So we modified QEMU to, um, so we modified just one file in QEMU, it's called vl-android.c, uh, VL which basically is the, main, is the main file of QEMU, and we inserted uh, a call to, plug -in to a plugin manager. So the plugin manager basically has a configuration files and file and looks at all the shared objects uh, that are specified in the configuration file, and it registers all of all these plugins here. So that all the logic for doing the system called tracking, tracing, uh, the binary reconstruction, and everything is actually here in the CopyDroid plugin. Which means that when you have to move from one Android version to another, chances are that also Kimo changes, and retrofitting your plugin manager to Kimo is just a matter of a couple of hours at most, um, and this works seamlessly. Okay. As another point, you might just think it about, it. yes, but you need to write the code to, to create the stub to do the system called tracking, the binary tracking. Well, this is actually done all automatically. So there is, there is one file that is shipped with the emulator. It's called syscalls.txt, all capital. And that contains the list of all the system calls of, uh, of the current kernel that is shipped with this particular Android version. And we create automatically, so we parse that, and we create automatically stubs to reconstruct the behavior of those calls. And for the binary transaction, we rely on, on the Android interface description language. So if you're used to remote procedure call as, a, as an idea, you also should be aware of this IDL file. So the IDL in, is the inter interface description language, which basically is a file that tells you, uh, it provides a signature of the call that is involved in the remote procedure call. Because you want to have programs that create stubs in automatic, automatically to marshal the information that you, need, that you want to. So this is the way that we do it. So how it works under, under the hood? Um, so at the very beginning, it's just you know, parsing a few data structures, so it's not um, black magic. So when you do see this IOCTL call, we found out that it's a dev binder one, and this is the transaction that we're interested in. Then the blob of data that I showed you before is represented by this structure that is a binary write rate structure. And there is one field of the structure that points to a sequence of binder command and transactions. Now, we are interested in, in transactions, so we just traverse that uh, by parsing the data structure, and we identify this information here. Once we identify the information there, well, we start parsing that information as well. So a few things are quite easy to, um, to unroll, specifically the target and the code. So the code is the method of the, of the, of the function you want to invoke, and the target is the interface that you're invoking this method on. Um, so this is a, a number. So a number that you have the mapping in the AIDL, so it's easy to reconstruct this information. Um, the tricky part here is on the parameters that you pass. So again, we want to know not only that this is a send text message that you want to send out, we want to understand, okay, what, what you're trying to send it out, okay? So, and for the arguments, it's slightly different. Now, if the arguments are primitive, so a primitive type, strings or integers, that is actually a piece of cake. Okay, because I'll show you with an example. So if the numbers are primitives or integers, they are um, uh, UTF-16 encoded in the parcel itself. So to marshal a 32-bit number, you just encode the number as 32-bit, okay? Big end, and you encode it there. To marshal a string, you just prepend the length of the string, and then you encode each byte of the string, as a 16-byte uh, UTF encoding, as simple as that, okay? So to, to unmarshal this information is super easy. Now, the tricky part is when you have to unmarshal complex Android objects. So intent is one of these objects, but you can think about any other objects that you have involved in any binder transaction. So how do we do it? So there, there are two different ways to do it. Either you write the code to do the unmarshalling yourself. So you know the prototype, so you know the signature of the um, of the um, in, of the binary transaction that you are about to um, unmarshal, because that is provided by the Android interface description language. So you know exactly in a buffer when there is a string and how to deal with that. When there is an integer and how to deal with that. And when there is a complex Android object, then to unmarshal it, you have to look at the source code to understand how this object can be unmarshaled. The problem is similar to what we had before. We don't have the energy to do this for all the Android objects. So at that time, this is a statistics that came from um, uh, Marshmallow. 
Um, no, sorry, sorry, from KitKat. At that time, we had 300 and counting Android objects that were involved in binary transaction. Uh, now, objects are a lot more. There are more Android, Android, Android transactions, binary transactions, so we don't really want to follow the manual process, okay? So, how do we do with this? Um, well, we, we don't know how to do it, but the Android runtime system knows how to do it because it needs to be able to deal with these messages. So what we did, we just rely on something we call the, the Oracle. Uh, it's more like, you know, matrix terminology. So someone that knows everything about everything. Um, and it's basically, in our current implementation, it's just, um, it's, it's, it's just another Android emulator. This time is a vanilla emulator, so it's not been modified. But be aware, the modification we made to the original Android emulator is just the um, ability to invoke plugins. Okay, so we, we don't modify the emulator anymore. And the operating system is not modified at all. Um, so we, we have this Android emulator running alongside with, the modif with CopperDroid. And the idea is actually this emulator runs the same uh, runtime of um, CopperDroid. So there is the same runtime Android version of, on both. And whenever, we, whenever the first uh, emulator encounters a binder transaction that has complex objects, well, it just sends to this Android emulator the signature of the method that uh, is involved and the blob of marshaled information, okay? So this emulator, basically, what, what it does, it uses a Java reflection to instantiate at runtime an object of the class that was sent over as the information from the original emulator, and then reading from the parceled object, so there are APIs that allows you to read from that, Read from, read from parcel is the API that we're using, into an object that we just created. So at that point, you have, at runtime, a representation of the unmarshaled version of the object that was sent marshaled up front. And, and then at that point, you just return back the string representation or whatever information uh, you want to look at. So to understand a bit more how it works in here, so strings, this is the example that we had at the very beginning. So strings, this is how the copy drive works under the hood. So this information is easy to, to parse because it doesn't require any, um, anything more than parsing the data structure involved in the IOCTL call at the beginning. Then here we have the number 78555512234. This is 10 digits. So 10 is uh, the length of the string. Um, sorry, represented as a 32-bit number. And then you have seven, which is in uh, hexadecimal 34, and it's UTF-16 encoded. Then you have eight, which is 38, 555, five, five, 35, 35, 35, 35, and we have one, two, three, four, which is one, two, three, four, okay? So this is easy to unmarsh. The next one is null, uh, which is the source number, is just four, zero byte. Then we have the message i there, and then here again is a string, so the length of the string is prepended to uh, the message, 8 byte is the length of the string, and then we have the string i there. So this is just the encoding of h, this is um, a 69 hexadecimal is uh, lowercase i, and so forth and so on. Okay, so let me just skip a few things because we're running very late. But this is the way that it works under the hood, pretty much, okay? So in terms of output, what we get out is just a JSON representation of a trace, of a reconstructed trace of system calls. Um, we just finished developing a RESTful API, so the idea is the system is not alive yet. Um, there is a very old version, but the idea is to get live very soon, and the hope is for you guys to use it. So there is a RESTful API, you just uh, ask for a login and password and, uh, um, and the uh, API key to actually submit APK applications and get back the um, analyzed version, so the dynamically analyzed version. This is the JSON file here. Uh, this is for, sorry, this is for system access. So what we do also, we group similar system call together. Sorry, not similar. System calls that are related together because we want to create this high-level behavior. So if you see open, read, 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 that is scattered throughout um, um, the calls, but they are related because those reads all, always operate on the same resource, then we group this together as a file system access and we tell you what type of file system access is, okay? Because in this case, you also can uh, have a shortened behavioral profile that is easier to understand. Same thing happens for natural transactions. And um, 
this is what happens for the binary transaction. So you have all the information about the reconstructed behavior, um, the arguments of the, of the call, and so forth and so on, okay? And the system called the generated this with the timestamp, so the ICTL as we've seen before. Now, the question that we asked ourselves, okay, beside understanding, so having a system that analyzes the application automatically, looks only a system call, but provides a very rich behavior profile, regardless of whether this is initiated from Java or native code, because we don't dis distinguish, right? So as long as you have a system call, it's fine. Um, we wanted to understand whether this could be useful for uh, doing classification, okay? We tried to explore this problem at this stage in a slightly more challenging situation, so we wanted to perform not binary detection, so not binary classification, so good or bad, but we wanted to see whether we could identify family of threats, so multi-class classification, which requires you to, um, I mean, the, in the binary classification, a random uh, choice will give you a 50-50 chance to get the right one. In a multi-class classification, is one over the number of the classes. So if you have more than two classes, the odds on randomly to, back to, to pick the, the good one is even low. Um, so this is the infrastructure. So we have Copper Droid. We fit it with some training data. We'll tell you a little bit more about the training data. And then we have test data here. And then basically what happens, we, we get the classification results out. So in here, we try to experiment with different semantics. So the first one here shows you just a system that is fed with system calls. So the data set comes from a, a publicly available data set that's called Drabin. It contains five th more than 5,000 malware samples divided in 188 uh, families. So here we analyzed all of them. So we had the behavioral profile, and then we partitioned the data set, and one part of it goes to train the, the model underneath. For those that are interested, we're using SVM, Support Vector Machines, um, as a way to partition the, the space in classes. So here, if you use only system calls, you get to 70, slightly more than 70% as accuracy. Not too exciting, okay? Not very good. Now we try to include the binder reconstruction, because we thought that that was actually quite semantically interesting. In that case, we're able to boost, to boost the accuracy to, from 72 or something to 82, 84 maybe percent here. So it is actually a good boost. So 10 points in machine learning is huge. And the more you go toward 99 to, to 100, which you'll never get, um, it's, it's challenging, it's more challenging. Now the problem why we cannot, so adding binder, trans, uh, I'm, sorry, adding binder semantics is interesting, is important. The fact that we cannot push even further more here is because it's dynamic analysis. Dynamic analysis has a specific limitation. You can only um, observe what you execute. It's, it's, it's intrinsic in the analysis, it's not something obvious, it's obvious, but which means that you have coverage issues. So if you don't provide an input that triggers that specific behavior, well, you don't see that. And that's why we, we cannot sometimes see more because the, maybe a server that the application was contacting is no longer available, or maybe because there is a GUI and we don't have the ability to uh, stimulate the GUI furthermore other than using random, um, random clicking, random tapping. Okay? So we wanted to understand whether we could push this even slightly further. So is it possible to rely on some statistical confidence to improve the situation? And instead of having one class as an output, having a prediction set. So something that tells me, hmm, hey, look, this sample, I'm not entirely sure whether it belongs here, but I can tell you that with this specific error that you set up front, from a statistical perspective, I can tell you that with, bounded by that error, your sample is either in a family A or family B or family C, okay? So that narrows down the choices that the analysts have to look at, um, which is much better. So we rely on something that is known confirmed predictor, I'm trying to summarize it here because we're just going, um, but I wanted to have it there so you guys can have a look at. So it's a statistical learning algorithm that outputs um, p-values along with uh, classification. So p-value is statistical support that you have for that classification. And without, so let me just skip to, to the result here. So here we have that on average, we can boost our, uh, uh, precision, let me see, that was here, so it was 87, okay? So we can boost our precision up to this point here, 93, which is pretty good, but the catch that we have to pay, of course, is that we have to consider a lot of classes in the prediction set, okay? 
So, but if you are happy with something slightly lower and you look at the recall, maybe a point like here, you can actually get um, a good result, so almost 88%, um, and you have to consider something like eight classes over 25, which is again, not super exciting, but a lot better than just randomly pick a class that you don't know whether the sample belongs to, okay? So to conclude, copper droid to dynamically analyze the system, we only look at system calls to reconstruct the behavior, and this works without, uh, without modifying the operating system. We can reconstruct behaviors regardless of whether this is initiated from Java code or, or native code, it doesn't really matter, we can reconstruct this binary transaction as well. This information is actually useful for multi-class classification, we're expanding it to dynamic, uh, sorry, to binary classification and to a little bit more sophisticated models. We also observe that the same approach here enables you to understand when a model starts decaying. So whenever it's time to retrain your model. Um, we have a RESTful API done and the line deployment soon because we're, I'm sorry, I'm just scratching the mic. Um, uh, the online deployment soon, but if you are interested and would like to use the system, just drop me a line, okay? Uh, a few reference here, I know the slides were very dense, but I made it on purpose, so a few re reference here on what I've just mentioned in all the slides. So if you want to dig into the details, please have a look at these papers. And as fine as a shameless plug, I'm hiring multiple PhD positions. This is research, it's not a company, let's just try to. So multiple PhD position, couple of postdoc position, working on this concept. Uh, if you have CSC and background, expertise in program analysis and normal machine learning, please let me know. Contact me, visit the lab webpage, and thank you very much. <laughs>